I'm Julie Zenner, and here's what you'll see next on Almanac North. Starry Skies North is working to douse light pollution and bring darker skies to the region. We'll learn more about the group's efforts. A team of swimmers swam from Split Rock Lighthouse to Duluth this week to highlight warming waters on Lake Superior. And the United States Energy Secretary visited Mountain Iron and Duluth this week to see how federal investments in green energy technologies are paying off. Those stories and voices of the region up next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. Denny is off this week, but let's take a look at some of the week's stories. The annual Duluth Superior Pride celebration began Thursday with the mayor's reception and at the St. Louis County Depot in Duluth. The reception kicked off the 37th year of Pride in the Twin Ports. Activities include the Pride Festival at Bayfront Park on Saturday and the Pride Parade beginning at noon Sunday on Tower Avenue in Superior. Duluth Salvation Army received a generous donation this week that will help keep the Army's housing program solvent. A $200,000 check was presented to the Army Thursday from the estate of Karen Halbeck Maine, who passed away in 2022. The gift came at the perfect time to fill a $130,000 deficit in the Salvation Army's housing program budget. Legislators on the Capital Investment Committee will visit Northeast Minnesota next week on a bonding tour. Lawmakers will visit sites hoping to be included in next year's Capital Investment Bill. Committee members will visit Moose Lake, Proctor, Duluth, Two Harbors, and many other sites applying for state infrastructure funding. And the Duluth Lions Club will hold its second annual Strides for Diabetes rally on Saturday, September 9th. The event runs from 8 a.m. to noon at the College of St. Scholastica's Summers Lounge. The event will include a, strider, a Strides walk, diabetes information, and free diabetes testing, all to raise awareness and funding to prevent diabetes. This week's blue supermoon was easy to see in the night sky, but many other celestial sites are obscured by light pollution. The organization Starry Skies North works to curtail stray outdoor lighting and make the night skies visible for all. Here to tell us more about Celebrate the Night Sky Week is Bob Foucault, Vice President of Starry Skies North, and Andrew Papke Larson is a board member with Starry Skies North. And welcome. Thanks for being here. That, you, that super blue moon was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, now you two are, are interested in the night skies all of the time though. Talk a little bit about what light pollution is and how it, it inhibits being able to see things up in the night sky. Sure, and it, it's, well, it definitely um, creates a light dome which mm -hmm. causes, uh, uh, it re reaches far out from the sources, especially with the bluer light, the whiter lights. Um, but besides uh, obscuring our, our view of the night sky, it also has negative health effects, uh, negative effects on the environment. Um, birds need darkness for migration, and that's important here in Duluth. So it, uh, it has a wide range of, of negative consequences. Mm -hmm. Andrew, is there a way to measure light pollution? Yeah, there is. Um, a good way to measure it and a well-known measurement is the Bordel scale, which mm -hmm. is kind of a measurement of how we can see the night sky. Um, and that ranges from one to nine. And it uh, definitely is a lot brighter, higher numbers uh, in urban areas. So if you're here in Duluth, you're gonna have a higher border scale number than if you're out, um, maybe out in the boundary waters. Mm -hmm. Bob, you mentioned that light pollution impacts health. Mm -hmm. Speak to that a little bit in terms of how, how that occurs. Sure, well, all of life on Earth has um, um, evolved with day and night. Mm -hmm. And now the nights are getting brighter, um, very bright in some you know, places. So you know, we need that circadian rhythm to have uh, melatonin produced when it, when it becomes dark. So it's throwing off uh, sleep cycles, both for humans and for, for wildlife. Mm -hmm. Is there any evidence that light pollution leads to biodiversity loss, anything like that? Well, um, just to jump back real quick to the melatonin in humans, there's evidence mm -hmm. to connect light pollution with uh, different levels of cancer, as well as a lot of other chronic diseases, such as um, heart disease or diabetes. 
And there's also a lot of evidence to support light pollution having harmful effects on a lot of different animals. And that, of course, goes back to the fact that for millions of years, it was day and night, um, and there was no light at night. Mm -hmm. What about the safety aspect of, of light at night, both to, to just make sure that people can see where they're going and to... Security. Yeah, right. crime. Right. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's always an important consideration. Mm -hmm. And brighter and more lights don't necessarily equate to safety. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, there's, there's many uh, studies that have shown that cities that have put in better ordinances for lighting have, had, have not seen an increase in crime. Um, glare from bright lights can actually uh, cause you not to see into the shadows and not to see, you know, be aware of your surroundings. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a matter of directing the light where it's needed. Um, the color of the lights is important also, but um, you, know, you, can have, you can have good dark sky friendly lighting and, and perfect you know, safety also. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, not, we're, the, you know, we're interested in uh, um, having dark skies, not dark ground. So, right. you know. And Andrew, I understand that you are a landscape architect. Um, I am, yes. Do you find that a lot of um, businesses and organizations or, or even um, homeowners think about light pollution when they're designing their projects? Yeah, yeah. It's something that has been in the background, but it's coming up more and more. Um, the kind of standard way in the past has just been put up more lighting because we can and it's not very expensive and we think it makes it safer. Um, so really now we're starting to tune into the idea of, like Bob said, you know, we can do this smarter. Uh, more light doesn't mean safer. Um, we can think about the, the better ways to put in lighting where we need it um, and the right lighting choices. Mm -hmm. So it's something that's out there, but um, certainly becoming more of an issue uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. So. Did you want to? Oh, uh, and, and using uh, controls like motion detectors and things. So that, that's, uh, um, it, it uh, improves the safety. You know, you don't have to have the lights on continuously. Uh, when, that, when there's a motion and the lights come on, that's when you notice something happened differently. Mm -hmm. How's Duluth doing, or the Twin Ports mm -hmm. doing, I guess, overall, in terms of um, trying to be friendly to dark skies? Well, Duluth has a, has a, a good, good lighting ordinance. We, we're working with them, talking with them to improve it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, the Starry Skies North started really back in the, around 2015 mm -hmm. um, with a group of people that were um, interested in, in talking with the city about the, the 4,000K, the bright white lights that they were starting to put up. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's made a difference and now there, there's, uh, there, it's, it's an improvement from back then, definitely mm -hmm. an improvement. Mm -hmm. And more people are aware of dark skies these days. Uh, I understand that uh, there's an Emmy nomination for a, a video that you produced. Right, uh, right. well right I was here. a director and, director and editor on uh -huh. that um, along. Uh, yes, Northern Night Starry Sky is produced by, by uh, PBS North right here. Mm -hmm. uh, I just heard this morning that it was nominated for a regional Emmy, so that's great. So the, yeah, the awareness is increasing and, that, and that's really our main mission is to increase public awareness and you know, get, get this discussion out in the public vocabulary. Mm -hmm. so. Well, let's talk a little bit about Celebrate the Night Sky Week, which will be coming up uh, about a week from now. Um, what's the, the purpose of having a week designated to this? Yeah, so the week's goal is really to raise awareness mm -hmm. about the value of our dark skies and light pollution, um, as well as just to celebrate the beautiful night skies that we have here in Duluth and in the area. Um, and we've got a lot of great events that do just that throughout the week. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we kick off uh, the week with Hawk Ridge, looking at some birds and talking about their impacts and how they're impacted in the migration with the night skies and light pollution. And then uh, throughout the week, we do a lot of different things. We've got trivia, we've got a free planetarium show, um, as well as a key event at Fitgers on Thursday. And then we finish up the week uh, at Saturday at the aquarium. Mm -hmm. the Talk week. about that event at Fitgers. Yeah, we've got, uh, it's going to start with a happy hour at 6 p.m. We've got raffle prizes, uh, silent auction, um, and then we have Michael Monroe, uh, the Minnesota extraordinary guitarist and singer. Uh, so we have a concert with Michael Monroe, and then photographs from Travis Nowitzki from his upcoming book, um, Spirits Dancing. Uh, 
uh, he's a great photographer from up in Grand Portage. It, he was featured in the documentary. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Bob King, Astro Bob, who will take us on a tour of uh, the night skies and tell us why we should always be looking up. And uh, a, a certificate recognizing Vickers for yes. as a dark sky yes, friendly uh, business. We have a new business, uh, a, a new initiative for uh, recognizing businesses that are dark sky friendly. And so we'll be presenting that to, uh, to Scott Vesterstein and Fitters at the event. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that they've done? Well, all of, all of the lighting inside and outside of Fitters is no brighter or well more hotter than 2700 Kelvin. So that's like incandescent lights used to be. So it's warm light, it's a, a healthier light. All the lighting in the exterior is actually even lower Kelvin. So it's more toward the orange and yellow and that's mm -hmm. wildlife friendly lighting. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, Scott's been kind of a leader in, in the movement here with uh, business friendly light, dark sky. Mm -hmm. It's also fully shielded, so you're not gonna get that glare light coming into your eyes. It's, right. And I'd love, uh, yeah, to invite viewers to go and check it out because it's got a really nice warm feeling. So the feeling between that and being under a bright white light is much different. So the experience of being in those spaces is also really nice. So and that Keystone event is going to be on September 14th? September 14th at the August Fitters room that's on the top floor of Fitters. Okay. Do people need to get tickets or register uh, There's a registration on our, our, on our website. It's, all the events are free, but for that one, because of the room size, we're asking people to register. Um, and that's starryskiesnorth.org. All right. Well, that's all the time we have, but okay. thank you so much for coming okay. in. Good luck. I hope it raises awareness and you get good turnout at your events. Yeah, Thanks come on so much. Appreciate it. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. This week, six experienced long-distance swimmers teamed up to swim from Split Rock Lighthouse to Duluth, a distance of 48 miles. It was the longest documented swim in Lake Superior without wetsuits. PBS North videographer Steve Ash produced this video of the historic relay swim. When, the, when they sound the foghorn, I'm going to know that it's time for me to enter the water and I'm going to start swimming with the kayaker out towards the sailboat. The sailboat's going to be our, our, our main escort vessel. So it, the sailboat is going to set the direction and the swimmers are going to set the speed. It's 10 minutes to 8 right now. Okay, I'm ready. Anytime. We're just waiting. They must be having breakfast. <laughs> there's six swimmers, there's a kayaker, there's um, two boat captains on, on, on the dive boat, three captains on the sailboat. There's a lot of, lot of people out there. All right. Welcome. Go get your little towel. Okay. Do you need help stepping oh, over? Oh, okay, got it. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'm carrying. It's great out there, you guys. Just good to get the butterflies out first leg. Yeah. We had some three foot swells with a lot of white caps later in the day. Um, I found those just exciting. I, those were my, those were the swims. I kind of lost track of time and I could have kept going just because I was so um, involved in what I needed to do to swim through that. Neutral, you're good to go. Oh, I love swimming in the dark. <laughs> Why? Oh. Just, it's different. You never know what you're gonna get. Swimmer on deck. That was a long hour. Yeah. Is that a tougher one? Yeah, the fatigue is settling in. All right. It's a great morning. Look at how it's sunny. Look at the wind is coming. You get to finish this out. Are you excited? Yes. I'm like lucky for this one. It's <laughs>
like in so close and so mile. We have six people in our relay that, that swam in our rotation, so we each had four turns in the water. Uh, we were just finishing our final rotation when Craig hit the beach. The reason this is being organized is to draw some attention to the fact that the lake is warming at a really rapid rate. And, um, and of course that's attached to bigger huge issues like climate change and that type of thing. The documentary we're doing, A Sea Change for Lake Superior, really looks at that issue. Uh, what does that mean? What is the fact that uh, the surface waters of Lake Superior are now four to five degrees Fahrenheit warmer than they were 30 or 40 years ago? What does that mean for the legacy of this incredible cold water lake, the largest freshwater lake in the world? It's got 10% of the world's surface freshwater. So it's warming up. Uh, what does that mean for the lake's natural systems? What does it mean for communities of people who live along its shores, uh, commercial fishermen, people who love to swim in the lake? So those are, we're really examining those questions. And so the swim helps to kind of bring awareness to that. You know, we've had, uh, it seems to have uh, touched a chord. People are excited to know about this group of swimmers who are out there uh, doing this. And so it really is a way of helping to uh, communicate that message. We feel like this is a this is a national story. You know, Lake Superior is um, an extraordinary uh, resource. Water has become such an important issue for everybody, and the amount of clean, clear, uh, cold, fresh water that's here uh, is of increasing importance. And our coverage of the event is part of a PBS North documentary co-produced with Hamlin University's Center for Global Environmental Education. The documentary, A Sea Change for Lake Superior, examines what the lake's warming waters may mean for people and for the lake itself. The documentary will debut later this year on PBS North. United States Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm visited northern Minnesota this week. The federal energy czar toured a mountain iron solar panel manufacturing plant, which is benefiting from federal investments in green energy. Later, she visited the solar garden in Lincoln Park, where PBS North videographer A.J. Larson caught up with her. The great thing about what the president wants to see is that every pocket of America can benefit from the Invest in America agenda, mm -hmm. meaning all of these tax credits that are available make small communities, big communities irresistible to those who want to invest. One of the announcements we had today was that the nation's largest community solar program was announced in Mount Nair, and that means that 400 communities across the country who don't have rooftops perhaps because they are renters or whose roofs may not be able to support or whose families can't afford the upfront costs associated with solar. They will be able to access solar power and solar power is now in many places the cheapest form of mm -hmm. power. Now for those who can afford uh, to, to have to install solar panels, the agenda is good for them too because That's it requires a 30%, it allows for a 30% tax credit if you want to install solar panels. For those who want to manufacture solar panels, there are tax credits for that, for all the supply chains. So all the way around from consumers to manufacturers to communities, it is really a wraparound strategy that really puts forward, pushes forward this clean energy agenda. We want to see community solar spread all across the country and the costs of the solar panels continue to drive down costs for people. So this example tells folks that anywhere you live, you can have access to solar power and be part of the solution, but also reduce your own costs. And the vast majority of cities across the country are under 200,000. I would actually argue the scale of communities like ours 
uh, can integrate impact more easily, more successfully, and I think with more innovation because we just know each other. Minnesota was a real leader in requiring utilities to allow community solar into the grid. So the the kind of the foundation for this kind of innovative community solar project is is here in Minnesota. And now, um, thanks to the work of President Biden and the administration, we have a federal partner who is ready to make sure that those projects can pay off quicker, that they can generate benefits um, faster for um, low-income residents who frankly been the ones who have often paid the biggest price for the pollution of fossil fuels. We're here to transform communities and and that's what programs like this, the leadership of Secretary and Senator helps us do. It really changes people's lives. It's time now for Voices of the Region when we hear from an area journalist about stories making news. This week our guest is Marshall Helmberger, publisher of the Timber Jay News and Tower. Officials with the Ely Hospital have announced that they've commissioned a study to examine how to address the financial problems that have been plaguing the Ely Ambulance Service for the past couple of years. The service, which used to be run out of the Ely Hospital, was spun off as a nonprofit entity more than 10 years ago, and it has struggled financially in the past few years. The cities of Ely and Winton and surrounding townships have been heavily subsidizing the ambulance service for the past couple of years is this been losing more than $200,000 annually. Ely isn't alone. Other ambulance services in our area are struggling financially as well. Most have switched to a paid on call model in recent years as they've been unable to attract volunteers as they did in the past. And as they must staff our, you know, their ambulance services 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at least on an on-call basis, the staffing costs alone have jumped remarkable for many services over the past few years, and that's leaving most of them in the red. The Ely Hospital is, is hoping the study can illuminate better approaches, and they plan to talk to neighboring ambulance services to see if there might be a regional solution to the problem. The ambulance services are caught between the need to pay their on-call staff and the fact that their revenue sources are largely fixed. Most of their revenue comes from 911 emergency calls, but those calls aren't really profitable since most are paid for through Medicare and medical assistance, and their reimbursement rates are usually well below the actual cost of providing the service. Most services can make a profit on non-emergency inter-hospital transfers, but most aren't able to do enough of them to close the gaps between revenues and expenses. We're also reporting on the death of Mark Phillips, the recently retired commissioner of the Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation Board or agency. But Phillips, who lived on Lake Vermillion with his wife, Patty, had previously served as commissioner of deed way back in the Perpich administration. But he spent eight years at the helm of the IRRR and brought about a major change in direction for the agency. While the IRRR had previously focused for years on job creation at all costs, Phillips thought it made more sense to focus on the quality of employment over quantity, especially since there was already a workforce shortage in the area. He also believed it was time to quit chasing smokestacks, as he put it, referring to the IRRR's longtime interest in bringing manufacturing jobs to the region. Instead, he pushed for a greater focus on the quality of life in Iron Range communities, increasing the agency's investments in community amenities and outdoor recreation. The IRRR spent millions under uh, his watch on things like hiking trails and biking trails, playing off the success that was experienced uh, down in Crosby with the mountain biking trails there. It's a tried and true economic development approach that focuses on building communities where people want to live. It attracts creative people and entrepreneurs, and over time, it creates a more diverse and sustainable economy. Phillips had been diagnosed with bladder cancer back in 2017, but had continued to work through the last year, even as he underwent a series of debilitating treatments for the disease. The treatments extended his life, but only for a time. He died at home on August 23rd at the age of just 73.
And finally, we're reporting on the bear season, which got underway today and runs through October 15th. Despite the dry weather this summer, the natural foods are abundant out in the woods. We had the best Juneberry crop in anyone's memory, and the raspberries, plums, and choke cherries are exceptional as well. That has a big impact on hunter success, since bears are less attracted to hunter's baits when they have natural alternatives, so we're expecting a lower than usual take this fall. That would be good news for bears, particularly in far northern Minnesota, where bear numbers have been slow to recover from the aggressive harvest a decade ago that cut the bear population in half. You can keep up with Almanac North by following the show on Facebook and Twitter. Go to the PBS North website for program updates, news about the station, and upcoming events. And don't forget to download the PBS video app to watch your favorite PBS programs anytime you'd like. And finally this week, a programming note. Next week we will broadcast a special hour-long Almanac North core conversation on legalized marijuana in Minnesota. Watch for that show hosted by Maria Hewitt on Friday, September 8th. From all of us here at PBS North, have a great Labor Day weekend. I'm Julie Zenner. Thanks for watching. Good night.